Hello and welcome to the first of the two 2022 series of California Library Association Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund training seminars. As you well know, today we're going to be talking about advocacy pitches. And we want to talk about the, the heart of what goes into this and start off with some beautiful images that tie back into the themes that we're going to be following here. We all know that pitches are those things that move us to action. And those actions, those calls to action need to be graceful, they need to be beautiful, like that mural that we're looking at now, colorful, to the heart, and they make you just want to respond to things. I think back at some of the great pitches I've heard both in libraries and outside of libraries over the years, when in my own neighborhood about 10 years ago, people wanted to take an old staircase, it was 148 step concrete steps, and turn it into something really beautiful and get rid of some of the problems we had in the neighborhood. The pitch was quite frankly, very easy. It was help us tile the staircase. And people who lived in the neighborhood understood what that meant. It was a cry to action. And that resulted in a successful $450,000 campaign to get mural tile artists to create and have installed that mosaic that people from all over the world come and see, all from a pitch of help us tile the staircase. When we think about library land, we've all heard those pitches about helping us to build a new building. And again, it's like telling stories. There are those six word stories where everything's there. It's help us build this building, help us improve the community. That's to the heart, it's direct, it's concise, it brings you in. As we look at those, that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. And I'm gonna ask Crystal if she wants to come in with some introductory comments that kind of set the pitch for us in doing our pitches. Sure, so as we come to this today, just being open to, you know, thinking about what has impacted you when you're hearing stories or other pitches, um, because a lot of that, the same elements that impact us are going to impact others. So it's really um, trying to tie in what do we care about, what matters, and, and being able to, to read your audience so that you're able to connect what matters to them um, as well. And then you're drawing them in and letting them know that you need them to make this happen. And so we'll go through all of those um, details today so that you have something tangible to leave with. You'll notice one thing that's gonna be pretty consistent here is we will have a few slides to get the main points up there to get our conversation started. But anything like this really is a conversation, which is the heart of doing a pitch. A pitch is meant to initiate a conversation that is substantial. And if we're gonna do something like that, we have to understand the hearts of the people that we're trying to reach. Those of you who are, were nice enough to join us here on the live version, we're gonna start here by asking the question to think through a pitch that has moved you to action, either within your own library or in your community or something else where you heard that simple thing that made you say, yeah, I wanna be there. For those of you watching the archive version, consider yourself part of this. You're the co-conspirators in this particular session. And while we're talking about this, we want you to also think about the pitches that moved you to action. If you have pen or pencil and a piece of paper, jot those down. What you'll do during this session is make notes so that by the end of the session, you walk away with something actionable that you can use within the next week or two to make a difference where you've been struggling to make that difference. So let's get the slides off, Crystal. Let's go down to the faces of the people here. Those of you that are in, Holly, you're included in this if you wanna jump in at any point of the conversation. What is a pitch that you have heard that moved you to action? Well, Paul, I don't know if this counts as a pitch necessarily, but I will always remember I was visiting the state capitol for a day in the district many years ago here in California. And you always see protesters at the state capitol. There's always groups walking around. And in this case, many, many years ago, it was cutting funding to UCs and CSUs was going on. And the protest was students wearing their sweatshirts from their UCs and CSUs. And they were sitting down. Oh no. They were very quiet and out of the way. They were obeying all the rules, but you could not walk anywhere in the Capitol without walking by these names of CS. Cal States and USC's and they were studying. Mm -hmm. And I remember just the visual of that to this day of that was going on and other ones that I've been in the Capitol, I've just found them annoying where I've just been like, oh my God, you're just in, go away. You know? But that one was like, oomph and they were obeying every rule they were, but everywhere you, you, it wasn't like you walked by it and it was gone, it was everywhere. So I thought that was just a powerful pitch in and of itself. That is wonderful. Let's think about the elements of that, all of you that are watching the archive version especially. 
Hillary talked about the idea that it was not annoying, it was engaging, it was visual. And again, our pitches don't always have to just be that six word story or the text that we use. They can also involve the imagery we use, like Crystal and I are using specific imagery that creates a narrative flow throughout this entire discussion that we're having today. Anybody else want to jump in with something that is memorable to them in terms of a pitch they saw? Thanks, Hillary, because I think that really effectively talked about what we're trying to get to here. We need to be creative. We need to not be annoying. We need to be inviting and engaging. Anyone else? Um, I can go. I'm not sure, again, like Hillary said, I'm not sure if this is exactly in a pitch, but I guess what sparks, I guess, my um, zeal for, for wanting to share more and more with, with the library community, I guess it would be book talk. Um, it's really simple. It's just a hashtag, book talk but then you see so many different varieties of how people engage with that hashtag, book talk. You see all these wonderful graphics, these wonderful short videos, um, it's exciting. And so it makes me wanna get out there and make sure that people see what we have in our library as well. And you hear that excitement, all of you that are on this live version of this, and those of you listening to the recorded version of it, there is that thing with the pitch that is effective is the one that makes you want to join the club too. It's the one that rather than being exclusionary is inclusionary. It bring, brings you something that is important to you in a way that is appealing to you. And at some level makes you say to yourself, I can make a difference. I think we oftentimes wonder, the issues we face are so complex, so world changing in so many ways and so stunningly difficult that we sort of throw up our hands before we get a chance to dive into them. And what you're hearing from what Hillary talked about and what Shamika just talked about, these are the things from the heart where it's low hanging fruit. You can pick a little bit of that apple and chew on that yourself and be part of, of what makes it go. And also think about what Shamika said here. This was not an overt six word pitch or anything like that. This was actually a very creative use of social media. And because I've done a lot of writing on this and a lot of studying of this, I would be the first to say, I do believe in trying to change the world using social media, but I also recognize that that's a tool, that isn't the whole thing. So if you incorporate social media into your pitches and you incorporate the face-to-face -face meetings you have, and let's, let's be 2022 about this, given COVID and what we've all learned, face-to-face -face doesn't necessarily mean you're sitting across the table from somebody. It means you're like in a group similar to this, where we are looking at each other and interacting with each other. The shape of our, our meeting spaces has changed. So when we create our pitches, they need to take into account the idea that they're not always with somebody that's two, three, or five feet away from you. They could be somebody half a world away from you. They could be on the other end of the state if we're focusing on our audience here, which is the California library community. And we use the tools we have to brought, bring people in. I wanna welcome the person that just came in, Coles, Jay Coles, and say, we're in the middle of a discussion talking about pitches we've heard that have moved us to action or that have been impressive to us. And then we're gonna go back into with Crystal and me talking a little bit about some of the foundations on this. Holly or Mr. or Ms. Coles, anybody else wanna jump in with a pitch that you've seen that was particularly moving to you? Okay, Crystal, it sounds like we're ready to bring up some more nice images and, and talk about the basics of writing a good advocacy pitch. As we look at this image that Crystal has brought up, it, it gives us a, a nice thing to work with. Think of an advocacy pitch as a game of tug of war. You know, you've got the thing and you're trying to pull people in. Those people on the other end of it are hearing your pitch, but they're also hearing dozens, if not hundreds of pitches in the course of a day, a week, and a month. And what we have to do to win our tug of war match is to be engaging, to understand what they need, understand what they want, and be there with them. I think a lot of people think that advocacy, especially in libraries, is going out and saying, we need this, can you help us? In fact, I think what Crystal would probably verify along with what I'm gonna tell you is, I see the best of these advocacy pitches working when you don't go out and say, here's what we need, but you start the conversation by saying what's important to you. Once you understand what's important to your community, then you find those opportunities where what members of the community want and what you want overlap. And that's where the heart of collaboration comes. Crystal, do you want to jump in with some, some background on what you see as advocacy pitches and the essence of them? I do. So I want to break it down even a little further. And the why do we need to advocate? Why do we need our advocacy pitcher, pitches? And the work that we do in libraries is very unique. And a lot of times, um, much of what we do is publicly funded. So anybody in our community 
may be part of our funding and how that cycle continues. So I know we have people here today in public libraries and academic libraries, and those operate a little bit differently. But when I think of public libraries, pretty much anyone you can meet in any space at the grocery store, your neighbor, um, you know, someone walking down the street, their taxes touch what you do at the library. Um, in the academic setting, it, it's similar but different. You know, every student there has a stake in what you're doing. Um, their, their families, their, the, the professors, everyone. And so we can, we can approach it in a similar way that we look at when we're breaking down the elements and finding that thing that matters, the purpose of it is because this person needs to care about what you're doing so that they can continue supporting that funding at, at the, the core of it. Um, and even if you don't speak to that directly in that conversation, um, that's part of what we need to remember in, in what we're doing is that we have to be able to talk to anyone and and make them see the value and what their tax dollars or their tuition dollars are going to um, you know and we can do this at many levels so the library administration or or director um, or the administration in a, a university they may be going to those higher level places to advocate maybe they're going to the state legislature maybe they're going to uh, board of supervisors um, but librarians, staff at all levels. Um, and then even when we're out, we take off our, our work hat and we're out in the community, those, you know, what we might think of as lower level conversations are just as important because the community members, the student body, they're the ones that are directly impacting the, the services that we provide. Okay, Paul, anything else to add to that before I move on? I think you really hit it. One thing that people that have seen any of the earlier sessions we have, and for those of you that are new to the series, we are posting the previous, the four recordings we have so far on our YouTube channels of California Library Association. The thing that runs through all this is the idea that we are talking to individuals and that we are talking not only to the people that are the recognized leaders that we're trying to reach, but sometimes the people that support them. If we're trying to get to a legislator, we'll go to a legislative aid and develop a long-term relationship with that aid because we find that that's the person that really makes things move. The legislators are working in the legislature with the laws. The legislative assistants are the ones that have the time to work with us to identify community needs and work together. So thanks, Crystal. Let's go on to the storytelling. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty later, um, but when we think about what our pitch can actually do um, and how the, the overall feeling of it is really about a story. So the core of any good advocacy pitch is a story, a story that's going to make the listener care about you know, the characters, the conflict, the outcome. That's, those are elements you see in a, in a regular narrative, but that, those are also important elements when we talk about advocacy pitches. So in this case, the characters are most likely patrons, community members, students um, that are being impacted by library services and resources. The conflicts are the barriers that these individuals might be facing, and the outcome is how the patrons or the students in question are able to move through those barriers with the help of the library, library services. So when you're sharing your story, you're persuading your listener and the impact um, of that story is going to carry through the, the issues that the individuals might be facing. The outcome is how the patrons and questions are able to move through the barriers with the help of the library. So as you're persuading your listener, um, you want to think about what is it that is going to hook them bring them along with you. And then at the end, maybe giving them a notion of how they can help um, help this fight, right? Help break through this barrier that your patrons or your students are, are seeing. Um, your, your pitch can persuade a community member to vote yes on an upcoming tax measure. Um, it might be persuading a council member to support funding or remove barriers. Um, it might be as high level as persuading legislators to support and vote for bills that are dedicating funding in the state budget. Um, but on the ground level, I think what we need to practice as we're practicing our pitches is really just being able to share this with your, your neighbor, 
a clerk at the grocery store, friend at the gym, anyone in your community, or maybe it's your academic community that can spread this goodwill. I think one of the, the things that you could see is having a great story is someone else sharing the story that you shared. So when you imagine sharing your story and you have moved them so much that they're gonna go and tell someone else that same story because they care that much about it. Now, Crystal, when you talk about that sharing of stories, again, it takes me back to social media and the things I've learned and the things I've heard. It's often said that it doesn't matter what you yourself tweet, it matters who retweets that stuff. That's where your real audience is. When Crystal talks about spreading that message, that's that taken down to the face-to-face -face side of it, not just social media of you've got the message, but you've got to get it out to other people who get it out, get it out to other people and it continues growing. The minute that network gets broken because there's nobody else to say it, that's where the pitch stops. So that's an important part of it. Also, Crystal was really explicitly clear, I think, in saying something that people I've admired for many years, including Crystal, mind you, who I've just known for about a half year now, but I admire the approach she's got. People like Rio Rubin, who does a lot around or has done a lot around evaluating the effectiveness of library programs. She asks a very basic question that we all need to be asking when we make our pitches. And that question is the repeated question, so what? If you are judging the success of a library circulation program by saying, we circulated 100,000 books last year, Ria would pipe in with, so what? You go, well, what, do we, what do you mean, so what? I circulated 100,000 books. And she would force you to say, what was the impact of that on your community? And so without taking you all the way down that road, just think of how that progresses. So you circulated 100,000 books. You know that some of the people use those books to help them through difficult situations. Maybe somebody used that to get a job. Maybe somebody used library materials to better understand a terminal illness that a close relative was facing or that they themselves were facing. And these are the personal sides of things that that question, so what takes us to? When you finally get down to the, we circulated 100,000 books and some of those help people to deal with emotional issues. Some of them actually helped to create better end of life situations for people, or they help people make a transition from a dead end job to one that opened up the world to them. Those are the moving stories that are at the heart of our pitches. Crystal? Yeah, I just wanted to share an example. I'm someone that examples really helps me make a connection. And so I like to share that as much as possible. Um, you know, we talk in my system a lot about our e-resources and the increased funding for e-books, e-resources that we can share out in the community. So when we had a um, very high COVID surge and a lot of people were being hospitalized, I spoke to a nurse who told me that the access to the e-books were a saving grace for her patients. So she was in ICU working with COVID patients. They were isolated. They could not see family members. Um, a lot of them were not going to leave the hospital. And being able to listen to ebooks or audiobooks um, and have that instant and free access to library services helped comfort them at their end of life. And also, you know, people who were able to get better help them not feel so alone during that time until they were out of the hospital. And that example to me was like a real life impact that had a positive, positive impact on the community because of library services. Well, let's use this as an opportunity. We actually had a discussion slide up here, but Crystal, let's take the slides down because I think that gives us an opportunity to go right to the question we were about to ask, which is what matters most in creating effective pitches. You've just talked about the importance of eBooks for that particular audience. All of us on the call, here's a challenge to you. What would your pitch be to get funding for the program that Crystal just outlined for you? Again, one or two lines. It doesn't have to be for perfect first time out, but think about that. And those of you watching the archive version, put your brains into this. You know that you need money to do that program she's talking about. You heard the impact. What's your from the heart pitch? Anybody? you're watching the archive, you have not lost sound. This is just a technique we <laughs> use to make you think rather than us giving you all the answers straight up. This is your chance to shine and to actually start figuring out how you're going to apply what we're talking about today to the immediate challenges you have when you leave this conversation and bring it back to your own pitches. 
And you know, Paul, well, um, maybe our small group is thinking about how they would frame that. I wanted to speak to Shamika's question in the chat. Sure. She asked, how do you discover the impact beyond quantitative data? The testimonial stories can be sporadic. And so that's true. And one thing that I've found is really going, I mean, it's about creating relationships, right? So going out and talking to people, asking what they need, how library services have impacted them. Um, something that the library system I work in has done uh, very successfully are community conversations. So we, um, from one-on-one, -on -one, a set of four questions at a service point to larger two hour long sessions where you have um, a targeted group really, and you're asking them what they wanna see in their community, what services have impacted them and so on. And then you're getting those stories and that narrative. And we talk a little bit later in the session about um, being inclusive. And so just something to remember in that is when you are taking someone's experience or hearing their experience, also being transparent and asking them, can I share this? You know, we are wanting to get out there and get more support for this program that you've been impacted by. Can I share your story? And those, those stories are really, I think, the crux of what makes a good pitch. Um, the data is important, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. And that can help with the why. Um, why does it matter that Paul was speaking to, um, but, but really going out and just talking to people, finding out what they need, what works for them, and then bringing that into your pitch. And Crystal, build off just what you just said. Absolutely. If we think of everybody around us as part of our team, then writing pitches and getting pitches out there is so much easier. And the thing you just talked about in terms of collecting those stories and saying, can I use that? I do that all the time as a consultant. If somebody says something nice about me on LinkedIn, I'm all over them going, can I use it? Can I put that on my website? And as soon as they say yes, I tweet it out. I put it on LinkedIn. I put it on Facebook. I tattoo it across my forehead, which explains all those little marks you see up there. This is funny. It, you just find every opportunity you have and you encourage the people around you to also watch for those responses and feed those to you. If you, for all of you watching this, if you are at the center of the pitch writing process, you wanna let everybody know that you need feedback from them and from the people they know as to what's working and what's not. That is the gold in your bank. That is the coinage of the realm. So you said in chat, Shamika, that testimonial stories can be sporadic. Yeah, our job as people writing and promoting pitches and spreading the pitches is to be so accessible that people think, oh, you would want to, you would want to have known about this particular one because we do, and then we use them. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is write them down <laughs> because, <laughs> because when you need them, if you don't have them written down, they're gone. <laughs> but I don't know how many people in California at this point in libraries are actively using Facebook accounts to promote things that they do. I've done courses in this over and over again over the last 10 years. And I always find that we start with the idea that Facebook and Twitter are used as broadcast media, where we put something out and then we hope it sticks. And I keep telling them, remember, the term is social media, folks. It's social. So on our side of it, you do what Crystal was just talking about. You put something out on Facebook when you hear a good story, and you phrase it in a way that invites further conversation. So you just heard something that talked about the ebook thing that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Somebody tells you a great story, you post and say, what's your version of this story? And that is an invitation to other people to be part of your advocacy team, because it's all about collaboration and community. And let's bring that back to the question that we posed a few minutes ago. So what matters in creating an effective pitch? If I were going to be doing the pitch to the story Crystal told, it would be something refined along the lines of help members of your community be part of the community. You know, as soon as you say that, you've got the word help, so it's a call to action. You were saying your community or our community. So we're in this together. It's not me saying, I want you to do something. So let's do this together. And we've got that wonderful program of talking about what the ebooks mean to people that may be homebound or in other ways, finding that their social contacts are cut off. So if we flip that thing around and we talk about the story Crystal told and say, now, what did that produce and how do we get others? That becomes a foundation for writing the pitch for that thing. How can we connect community members to the rest of our community? You can help. 
You can donate to this. You can read to people. You can bring in some of the materials that we need. You can help us fund some of the pro programs we're trying to do at the state level to make materials more accessible to people that may not have access to them and to create things that are representative of the communities. If you're in a community that has people speaking several different languages and you find mat your materials are only targeted toward one or two of those language groups, then that becomes a, a wonderful, interesting pitch where you may write the pitch in your own language and then put it into the language of the people you're trying to reach and say, help us reach our community. And you put that in their language, that's the open door, folks. That deals with a little bit of what we also often talk about and struggle with. How do you make your community representative of the diversity that's there? You bring those people in and you do it in terms of draw those people in. Crystal, you wanna add anything to that? I think you have covered it well. That was a mistake. Should have never done that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring us back here. Before you do, before you mm -hmm. let let us just one more moment stick on there because this is, I'll be totally transparent here. Sure. My thing of trying to help people learn stuff is not just to give you answers, but to help you have you apply it right away so that you've got that in your hands when you walk away. Those of you who have been listening to this for the last few minutes and those of you at home watching an archive version, what can you contribute at this point to what do you think is effective or what do you think is essential in creating an effective pitch? Just based on what we said so far, what are one or two things that have to be in a pitch to make it effective? Purpose. Beautiful. And if you didn't hear that, purpose. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So Jay Cole said impact. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that comes to the measurement side. If you say up front, here's what I want to accomplish, and you do your pitch and you roll out that whole campaign, whatever it looks like, at the end of it, the simple evaluation, the so what question that Rhea asks is, did you reach that impact you were looking for? And if not, figure out where you didn't get there yet. Instead of considering it a failure, consider it a stepping stone toward making the impact that you want. So thank you. Anybody else? Well, I feel like it's cheating if I speak up, but no, not at all. <laughs> for me, um, connection. So finding that connection. Yeah. The, the words I always use in all these sessions, connections, collaborations, engagement. These are the things that have to be there. If it's academic, if it's all facts and figures, that may be good for some audiences, but facts and figures only go so far. I always think back to something that Genty used last year when we were doing some of the basic advocacy things. And she would bring up that wonderful picture of kids in their first communion outfits going to the bookmobile. You just look at that picture, even not knowing the story behind anything. Those kids stepped away from their first communion ceremony so they could go to the weekly or, or monthly visit of the bookmobile. That's engagement. That's a story that grabs us and says, me too. I get the so what in that. I see what we're doing in our libraries. I see what we're doing in our communities. And that level of engagement, those visceral things, come back to the storytelling that, that Crystal was just talking about a few minutes ago. All right, Crystal, run with it. Targeting okay. your pitch. Do it. Okay, so targeting your pitch. Um, we really want to think about who our audience is, who our stakeholders are. Again, um, it will depend on what kind of organization you're in or exactly what you are trying to advocate for. Um, one example is if, so in, our, in my organization, we focus a lot on early learning. So if I am going to a council member who is really you know, working on veteran services, they might not care as much about early learning for zero to five. So I might want to look at what are we doing that is supporting veteran services, or I might want to go to the stakeholder that's doing work toward early learning. Again, it's about finding that connection and knowing what your stakeholder is going to care about. Um, so I want us to take a couple of minutes to think about that, where we're at. So Shamika, I know you work in an academic library. So think about who are your stakeholders? Who will you be advocating to and what it is that they care about? And this is, it takes some practice sometimes. And, and so this is, you know, something I always talk about with my staff too, is that you have to kind of get out there and try 
first few times might not feel smooth or successful, but the more you do it, the easier it's going to be, the more that you're going to kind of read, you know, who's in front of you, you get used to that idea of like knowing your audience and being able to pivot. Um, and so that's, you know, something that I always think about is know your audience, know your audience, try to find that connection, you know, what they do for work, um, what they care about, and then that's what you want to speak to. And not in a, you know, when I, as I'm saying this, I want to be careful that it's not, we're not being inauthentic because when we think about the core of what we do, um, you know, I work for a public library system. I serve every person in the community. Doesn't matter what they do for work, what their background is. And so it is important to me that I, I know what kind of works for different people because I want them to get what they want out of, out of the library. Um, and so same for you as, as we talk about crafting our, you know, the more nitty gritty of crafting the pitch, having different versions, depending on who your audience is. Anything you'd like to add, Paul? I think you pretty much nailed it there. Thanks, Crystal. Okay, so crafting your pitch. So this is, we're getting a little bit more into what, you know, we're, we're gonna start writing down, what's gonna help us later. Um, so our pitches need to be perfectly crafted and as appealing as the mural that we're looking at. You know, you have a plan. The, the painters that painted this mural, they had a plan, probably something sketched out. Maybe they, they did a few runs beforehand before they put the painting on the wall. Um, and so we want to do that on our paper. And again, we're going to practice a little bit before it becomes uh, really natural to us. Um, so we've talked about the importance of a strong advocacy pitch and how it can directly impact support for library services. The importance of identifying and sharing what matters and knowing which stakeholders are going to respond most to those. So it's time to get the pen on the paper. And over the next 30 minutes, um, we're, we're going to be drafting out the advocacy pitch that you will start using with three stakeholders or groups in your community or that you work directly with. And again, let's take advantage of the fact that Crystal found these wonderful images that we're using. Let us think of this process exactly the way she's described it, where you put something down and then you erase a little bit of it and then you add to it. If we're gonna stick with the art mural image here. Let's think back to things that we've all seen if we've been lucky enough to see films like the one about Picasso and how he worked. There's that wonderful thing where it's about a 60 or 90 minute documentary. He's painting on glass so that the camera captures from the front what the painting is looking like. He's painting from behind and he gives him creating, constructing, deconstructing, reconstructing. And we want to do that. This mural didn't just come out of somebody sitting down going, I'm going to do this in five minutes. I got this idea. They had to play with it. They had to make corrections. And you're going to do that in your pitches. If you treat them with love and with affection and with an artistic endeavor and make them as, as engaging to people as you possibly can, you're going to draw them into your pitches through what Crystal has referred to as your authentic representation of what you're trying to get to and the collaborative spirit that she talked about just a couple of minutes ago. So the first thing that we would like you to do is write down a few of your groups or your, your stakeholders that you would be going to with your advocacy pitch. You know, we'll talk about other elements, the what matters to us, what connections we're making to that, and that will help us in communicating it. But first, we really need to know who your audience is, or you need to know who your audience is. So go ahead and just take a few minutes, um, write down who that would be, and then if any... Take the slide down and we'll just oh, sure. take this okay. conversational again. Those of you watching the archive version, same thing. Use the time here to start thinking about your audience and crafting the pitch. Think about the one thing you want to accomplish. Do not make it too scattershot. Make this one thing you want to accomplish and write your pitch to that. those of you in the live version, when you're ready, if you've got a pitch you want to run past this, let's kind of workshop this in a masterclass kind of thing. You put the pitch out, we'll critique that together with the spirit of trying to make it as strong as, as we can so that when you walk away, you've got something. And anybody watching this later can see that process in action, be encouraged to follow that same process 
so that we kind of spread the wealth on this. Okay, so is anyone willing to share their groups, their audience? Um, my audience are, um, or the three primary groups I would say would be faculty, students, and then community members. Perfect. There's an outlier group as well, but I think in order to, for our pitch to work, I think, or maybe, I don't know, or maybe I should swap out community for administrators because essentially they're the ones who are making the decisions financially. Um, yes. Okay. I'll switch it. So I'll do admin, um, faculty, and students. Those are my three primary groups. Okay, great. And so, you know, as we go along, you're really going to see how that pitch is going to be different for those three groups, right? Because those three groups essentially care about different things. So those three are really great examples because they're all so different. Okay. All right. I think it's just Shamika. <laughs> so you can go on here. You know, we, before we started the recording here, we were talking a little bit about the whole concept of knowing your audience. And Shamika had brought up a, a question at that point about what do we look at specifically in an academic setting as a virtual public library setting? And I can't remember if it was Holly or Crystal, but somebody mentioned, friend, maybe it was Shamika herself talking about friends groups, but we want to look out there and see what groups exist. And if there is a group that should exist, but doesn't, that can be part of our pitch too. We see that other libraries have friends groups and we don't. First question is, why don't we? And if we get a good answer to it that is workable, then we figure out how to get that going. So doing a pitch can be as simple as just putting it together for your audience, but it can also be a long-term thing where you have parallel courses going. You're writing a pitch and you're also creating the very audience and substructure that will allow you to get those pitches out. Great. Okay, so now that you have your stakeholder groups, we're gonna go through a few elements of the pitch. So the first, element. Paul, is it okay if I just continue on? Okay. Absolutely. So the first is the, the why. So why, why are you doing this pitch, right? So think about um, what should be included in there, the main point, what matters, um, what is personal to you? And we'll talk a little bit about that authenticity later, but as you're writing this, think about the issue at hand, and why do you care about that issue? I may have missed this, but Shamika, have you already identified a, a pitch that you want to make? Um, informal, actually, uh, well, informally, I kind of have been mulling around some ideas. Um, formally, no, I haven't actually jotted down and started um, drafting a pitch at all. So um, let's, make this, let's make this real right now. What is one thing that's, if you could, if you had the time and nobody was interrupting you for the next several days, what would be the one thing you would want to be out there promoting? And let's make that this sample exercise so that you walk away with something usable here. Right. So for me, that would be, um, oh gosh, I think I would want to do something that um, educates faculty. So one, um, I don't know how to say this on recording. Look, I'm being recorded, so I don't want to say this. But sometimes, <laughs> but we do have, but in, in all truth, though, we do have faculty members who sometimes they don't even know how to look up a book in our library catalog, and they don't know even when they when the search results you know are retrieved, they don't know the difference between a book and an article. And so, with that being said, is so yes, the library, we do whatever we can to promote the library because we want the students to know that we're here, not just for their study needs, um, but we're also here for their success, right? So we provide supplemental materials as well as textbooks um, that they may need for their classes. But the supplemental part, which is like the regular library part, the same as like a public library, we meet not just the informational needs, but your recreational needs. So we think about the student beyond just the academic, right? 
And so being a community college library, we kind of sit in that middle. We have um, we have students, well, we do have students of all ages, you know, so some may be returning from the workforce, um, some may be just trying to earn a certificate. However, the majority of our student body are high school students who have just left high school. They're really unsure and they're trying to get ready to transfer to a four-year college. And so we have this really neat place in the middle. And so we're able to think about, you know, how we could essentially serve almost some filling in the gap somewhere in some sort of way as a public library as well, because we're providing more than just the academic in order to get our students to where they need to be. Um, and so I, for me, it's the faculty side where I think we are, there's a disconnect because I don't think faculty completely buy in to one, advertising the library, two, sending their students to the library, and three, embedding us and immersing students, embedding us, the library, into their classes and immersing students in the library as a success tool for them, right? Um, and so I know I often have these conversations with my department chair about how can we educate the faculty? Because, you know, if you have the faculty who are the people that are molding all of these wonderful students, their minds and just molding them, um, their experiences, then our biggest advocate needs to be faculty. Mm -hmm. Let's so, go under the hood here and let's look at how, how this can lead us to creating a pitch and focusing on something that's meaningful. So we could correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing you say is that the pitch here is to familiarize faculty with what the library can do for them. Not just for them, but for their students, for their students' success. And I was going to go to that as the next. Because <laughs> yeah. okay. what I'm hearing, yes, I, I think that I think in finding what makes the faculty's life easier is going to hook them, right? True. But even True. though the end goal, right, is for them to be able to support the students better. Uh -huh. What is going to hook them? Because right now you know, it feels like they're not as invested in what the library has to offer. Right. And when I think about the life of a faculty member or the professors mm -hmm. I've known, they are always busy running from mm -hmm. one to another, <laughs> yes. you know, not super organized. It might be a stereotype, but my, <laughs> my professor. That sounds about right. And so, you know, it may be in their mind, oh, the library is just one more thing. Now I have to pile on to my. my right. Kid. And so exactly. Really, finding like, what about the library? What you do is going to make their life easier and build out from that. Right, right. Because we're definitely not trying to add on any work. We're not. Right. So if we were to take this in baby steps, we start with that idea of the faculty is your target and you want to get them into the library. Mm -hmm. And then the second step that Crystal so clearly pointed out is, and you said yourself, you want the faculty and those they serve. So now we're really honing in on that. So what? So what? we got the faculty. So what? So it's going to serve the students. So what? So those students will have resources that allow them when they graduate to go, or even before they graduate, go out and make a meaningful difference in their community. I was listening to a lot of the terminology you were tossing out when you were talking about goals there. And a few of them jumped out at me. You want to embed librarianship in what's going on so that it's an integral part of the learning process. You want to get the faculty and the students immersed in what the library has to offer. And the unspoken answer to so what is you want to produce something meaningful. So I'm sitting here working with you and with Crystal and with Holly saying, what would our pitch look like? Our foundation is the faculty and the students and those they serve. Some key words are the ideas of embed, immerse, produce. And I'm looking for a six word story. I don't know if it's too much jargon, but I would start playing with those ideas of embed, immerse, and produce as key words to get into the pitch and show the impact that it has out there. And Crystal said something that made a lot of sense too in terms of showing impact, make your life easier. So we've almost started to write a rough draft of a pitch and rather than write it for you, giving you all those words and all those terms, what comes to mind as the beginning of a pitch for you if you wanna reach faculty and get them and their students into your library using those terms we just bandied about together. Ooh, this is a tough one, but you, okay, so using the formula you kind of just laid out by using the terms embed, immerse, produce, right? So I'm going to go with that first, just because that's what's fresh on my mind. I don't want to lose this thought. So my problem is it would be more than six words. I'm not, I'm not that's really, okay. that's okay. It doesn't yeah. have to be that. That's just a goal to shoot for if you want to be oh, really Oh, okay. Targeted. I'm not the best at, you know, brevity. Um, None of us are. 
Um, so I would say, oh gosh, um, uh, in bed. Ooh, doo, doo. Okay, let me just talk this out. So in bed, I guess maybe these would be separate things. Maybe embed the library in your class because we're able to have Canvas courses or Canvas shells. We already do have one, but not every faculty member has bought in. But say, for example, we say embed the library in your class. That would be in meaning, you know, embed our Canvas course into your, your courses, into your syllabus. Um, immerse students in, oh gosh, immerse students. I would say, I want to say something like, because essentially with so much information out there and so much misinformation out there, um, immersion students, and I don't want to say credible information, that's so off-putting. Um, that's exactly what I'm thinking. You're on the right track, though. Yeah. In but, meaningful, yeah. useful information or resources. And again, but we the, want to get away from jargon. We want to find the words that are going to appeal to the right, teachers right, as well exactly. as the I'm students. Like, well, I don't like that word. Right, and so this is why it takes me forever to write stuff. Um, and then um, I would say produce students who are information literate, or no, produce students who are lifelong learners, because at the end of the day, as long as you planted that seed mm -hmm. of the quest for knowledge, like constantly thirsting and knowing the right way, knowing how to um, assess and evaluate not, um, information, whatever comes your way, basically without using the term information literate, because, you know, again, another library jargon term that people are kind of like, oh, what? What does that really mean? Um, but basically, we're, we're trying to produce lifelong learners. That, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And, and adults that are self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. right? There's an exercise I do in a variety of different contexts. It's where you take a term and you give the person a couple of minutes to respond to a very targeted question come up with all the words that come to mind when they, they hear that term. If we were gonna play this now, which we're not, mind you, but if we were gonna play it, you say, take two minutes and write down every word that comes to mind when you hear the term lifelong learner. And the result of that would be, you'd probably get some of the vocabulary you want to hone your pitch. You don't even have to do that with us now to see that that's a tool you could use. You might wanna jot down a note to yourself to try that later. Those of you that are watching this recorded version, set that aside. You might even freeze the, the recording here right now Take that two minutes to do lifelong learning as a term that you want to riff on and come back and see where you might go with the pitch that Shamika is trying to write, because it may be the pitch for you too. And as you think about this, drawing back to what we've talked about in the first half of this, this conversation so far, we are trying to create something here that's meaningful and actionable and that you will take out immediately and use. And that's what we're starting to get to using that whole question of so what? I feel personally we're very close to the edge of having the perfect answer to so what. We've got lifelong learning and the final so what from somebody like Rhea would be, all right, so what does lifelong learning produce? And the two minute exercise would probably give you the vocabulary to define it. Now, if I were thinking of in multiple tracks at the same time, trying to get myself to the pitch, I'd be doing what we're doing with Shamika. I'd be playing that little game of what does that key term produce in terms of a meaningful terminology. I'd be thinking how I would say that to an audience if I'm sitting across a room from them, or if I were in a session like this via Zoom or other video conferencing. I'd also be thinking about the kind of, of graphics I could be using. What comes to mind to me, and I'm saying this as a beginning, not an end point, I might want a really engaging photograph of a teacher with students showing the diversity of that campus, working together, smiles on the faces, not all of them looking boring. We all get those pictures of people just staring at the camera looking serious. That's not what we want for this. We want the students and the teacher at that moment of, aha, this means something to me. And then come back to what Shamika was saying. We're gonna make your life easier. So if I were just drafting the first draft of this, I'd have some kind of an image either that could have words over it or off to the side. I get those three key words, embed, immerse, and produce down one side in colorful typeface that's, that's attractive, but not overwhelming and then have the rest of the phrase off in smaller type, like immerse your students in, in lifelong learning or in performance, embed the library in your classroom and have that all there as like a three line statement with that image and then interested, contact this person or contact me at your library. That's the beginning of the pitch. And that's a formula that works. You know, everything that Crystal has been saying and what we're sort of working our way through with this example. And if nothing else, I hope that any of you watching the archive version understand this is an opportunity now to go back and look at those three steps, 
piece by piece rather than trying to memorize it. You know, as learners, that if you're here for 90 minutes, you're going to remember two or three key things if you're lucky. So having the archive version of it gives you a resource to go back to later. And certainly Chris and I are not going to disappear after this. You can always reach us. Our contact information's on the deck. We don't, we're not in witness protection programs or anything. So we're pretty easy to find on the net. And you can always come back and ask us questions as follow-up. That's what the whole CLA series here through Ursula Myers is all about. Bringing people together in a community to explore things, be better at our advocacy, and to produce positive concrete results in the communities we serve. That's the end of the commercial. Back to you, Crystal. Okay, thank you. All right, so we've already talked a little bit about that personal connection. So Shamika, I don't know yet in, in the scenario you're talking about if you have seen an example of a positive outcome of this. Um, so if you haven't firsthand, you know, maybe doing some research, we all know as librarians that um, as a student being well-versed um, and confident in, in media literacy, really, that we are going to be out, we're going to be able to go out into the world and be more successful, right, and self-sufficient. So I know that there are a lot of examples out there. So finding um, a really strong example of that and a few pieces of data and including that into your longer pitch, right? So you have kind of your, your six plus word opening that's going to really hook your audience. And then that story of, you know, if you have a personal example, um, maybe it's, you know, Professor Myers class, their students um, use this technique and they came out with, you know, 10% higher scores and we followed up with a survey and they felt more confident in going out into their academic career um, being able to access this, these resources on their own, right? And then giving that those data points, that's going to spark something in your stakeholder's mind as well. Do you have any examples you would like to add, Paul? No, I think that doesn't. That, I sort of derailed this up front. You had a really nice structure here of looking at the, <laughs> okay. the why, the who, the what, and how. Let's just review what you've got so far. The why in this case is obviously make your life easier. The who is the teachers and the students they serve and, and obviously the community beyond that. We're sort of dancing around the what. Crystal, you want to pick up there? Sure. So the what is really um, the barrier without this service or this resource. So what is that barrier that the students are coming up against that the support that you're giving them or that you're wanting to implement in the classroom by your services being embedded there, what is that going to do for the students? So really speaking to what that barrier is and with this resource, they're gonna be able to move through that barrier. So I do wanna stop and take a moment for you to write that down. What is the barrier and how will the resource that you're offering move them through that barrier? Again, reminder to anybody watching the archive version, good chance for you to be doing the same. So at the end of your watching this 90 minute conversation, you've got what Shamika's walking away with, something actionable, something meaningful to your audience, something that's gonna change your world just a little bit. And then I just wanna note to um, Shamika, you know, even if you don't have that example yet of the, the success story, right? Um, you know, you can leave that part out for now. And as you're doing this, um, and you're working with faculty, you're going to get those success stories and then you can work them in later. And maybe that's what then you take to um, administration, right? Like the library embedded this service into the classroom and here's the success of them being able to move through these barriers. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the how. So you're speaking to your audience, the faculty, so what can they do to make this happen? It may be, I, you mentioned something about um, buying into, was it an, an online classroom resource? Oh, no, well, um, <clears throat> for most um, classes, even the ones that are completely online, mm -hmm. they have the, um, what is the, um, oh my gosh, they have like the online component. Okay. 
And so what happens with that is just basically extra resources and different links that the instructor provides that are, you know, more live where you can click on it and access it versus static or something in your syllabus and you have to kind of go type in the URL. They can just click and go. And um, we do have one um, created by one of our fellow librarians, a canvas is what we call it a shell. Essentially, it's a shell because there aren't any enrolled students. That's, okay. that's why we use the terminology shell. Um, but it's a live course, course, so to speak, <laughs> that we create with all, all the variety of um, library resources and services. Great. So, so you're going to work into the kind of the end of your pitch of what the faculty member, you know, what the ask is, right? Is it they share this link with their students or they give you or a librarian there um, a few minutes of time in their first class meeting so that you can share these resources. And so it's really just kind of wrapping it up with the ask. So, um, you know, what, if you have your pitch going and then you might say, so it would be great or to make this happen if we could have 10 minutes in one of your first sessions that we can share this information with the students that will help them again, reiterate, become more self-sufficient and finding valuable resources, right? Or, or sharing that link. So it's that ask. And then I think before we move on, let's just kind of go back and look at those elements, just especially for folks that are watching the arch archive version. So it's the why, the main point, you know, what it is that that you care about, that you are trying to bring your stakeholder in on the same page as you, the why. And then the who, so whatever the story is, the personal experience or impact, and up to three points of data can help, but not too much. We don't want to overwhelm people with data. And then the what, so the barrier without this service or resource that you're, you're supporting here. And then the how. So whether it's the ask of what you need them to do to continue supporting this, or even if it's some time for you to share this resource so that you're able to move it forward. Okay, and then as I spoke about earlier, I really like to share examples because I, I think looking at it on the screen and seeing how all of these elements can play out kind of helps us get a, a really good visual. So Peter before, uh, sorry, Paul, Peter and Paul. I'm both <laughs> Peter's here. my director and I just heard him up there. <laughs> so, um, before I move on, did you wanna add anything before we look at the example? Okay. Perfect where it's at, thank you. Okay, so lunch at the library is a really important, valuable program that we offer at a lot of California libraries um, and definitely at the Sacramento Public Library. And so I always find that this, this means a lot to me. And so it's an easy one for me to share out to our stakeholders. So here it is laid out the why, the who, the what, and the how. So have you heard about our lunch at the library program? It serves healthy free lunches to youth 18 and under during the summer so that our community has access to at least one healthy meal while school is out, which is often the only place many children have access to consistent meals. So that's the why. That is the, the important thing that I'm looking at supporting or continuing. And then I'm going to move into the story. So one of the first families I met during our program last year was a family of four who came every single day we served lunch. They stayed after eating, reading books and participating in activities, enjoying everything the library had to offer. At the end of the summer, the mother of this family came to me emotional and said that her husband had lost his job just before the summer and they were barely making it, not having enough money for food and rent and basics. This program had saved their family and they will never forget that the library was there for them. I learned later that one in four children in the city of Sacramento go hungry during the summer. 
Without our Lunch at the Library program, many of our youth will not have another option for at least one solid meal a day when school is out. You can help support this program continuing by, you know, maybe it's voting on the upcoming tax measure, voting yes on the tax measure, or talking to your council member about this important program that the library does, or donating to the library or just being a member of the library can support this. Any questions on how this pitch includes the different elements or anything? Notice what's there. Actually, let's stay there one more minute, Crystal. Sure. Notice what's there and what's not there. There are not lots of figures saying there are millions of children starving right now. Millions we can't even picture. This gets down to that very specific uh, family that Crystal mentioned and saying, you can picture that. If we were actually doing a slide presentation in front of an audience making that pitch, we might want to have some of the families that are benefiting from it. Again, we might want to put that in the positive setting of the library and the looks of, of joy and appreciation on the faces of the kids that are there, the sense of community and camaraderie that exists between the library staff and the families themselves. And again, it draws everybody in. But the key word there remains what we've talked about so much here, collaboration and engagement. And that's what that story puts out. That's what we want our pitches to have. And we want to get to that six word story. You can almost hear the six word story and what Crystal's talking about there. Make a difference with families, make a difference within your community. Yeah, and you know, to me, it's, it's having that, that personal story is important. And it's not just about the one family, right? I mean, it's a real data point that one in four children in the city I live in go hungry during the summer because they don't have access to food at school. So all of those elements are going to, you know, but it depends on the stakeholder I'm speaking to, because if it's someone that, you know, really doesn't care about that might not matter to them. Um, so that kind of takes us into the next part about being authentic and inclusive. These are two elements that even though they're not in those, you know, the nitty gritty of writing your pitch are going to, to have your pitch make the impact that you want it to. Um, and being authentic, I just mean like, do you really care about this? And, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have the personal experience, but, but you probably do have to care about it. So for me, the lunch at the library program is very close to my heart. I grew up a hungry kid. And so that every time we give meals to kids during the summer, I see real value in that. Other people might not, and that might not be their pitch, right? But for me, I can go out and talk about lunch at the library because it really, it is important to me. And so that's going to come through, maybe not when I'm reading my notes in the training, but when I'm actually just talking about it out there, um, it's gonna come through that, that this matters. Let's highlight what that just meant. Shamika, you've been listening to us talk about this. We've been bouncing back and forth with ideas. Much of it's been theoretical. We've been trying to apply it. When Crystal said, I was a hungry child, how did you react? Um, that really just pulled it all together for me. It, even though the story that you know she told of the, the family that shared their story, even though that just so, so sealed the deal for me, um, for me personally, even though I can't identify with that, it still was impactful and it made me realize the importance of the program, even though I already know the importance of it. But my point is like, if I didn't know still, and, and even if that's not my story, it still drew me in and caused me to see something as personal versus kind of this abstract, um, we're asking for something in the abstract, but it makes it more personal. Crystal, I didn't know that. And when you said it, I don't think it was visible on camera, but I just sat up like, wow, you're mm -hmm. part of that too. Mm -hmm. And there's a killer lesson for all of us. We can talk all day long about the theory behind this, but when you see that moment that is so natural and it doesn't, it's not accompanied by special effects or lots of choirs of angels singing in the background, that simple from the heart, honest statement of, I was a hungry child too. And then you just go on with it. That's the pitch. That's the yeah. killer moment. And I think really that, that, authenticity, right? That transparency of being able, you know, and I think that's something I do a lot of like, you know, 
I'm just doing my best here, right? <laughs> it's like, um, I might in that conversation say, you know, I, I know what it was like because I was that kid. I was hungry. And because I had access to programs that could feed me, I was able to move forward in other parts of my life, right? And really being able to bring that to the table. But what I don't want everyone watching or listening to this to think is that you have to have the, those personal experiences to really have an impactful pitch because there are going to be many things that we might not have a personal experience with, but we can see and we know um, the importance and the value of it. But I think that whether it's personal or whether you care, that's going to, to come out. You know, and I think about those sayings of write what you know, um, that it's like when you're when you're writing about something you know about, it's going to flow better it's going to come out more naturally. Um, and if you've had that experience where you're talking about something and someone says, wow, I can see that you really are passionate about that because the way you're speaking about it changed, that's the thing that you should be focusing on. I just, that moment to me is like the moment you look for in any kind of a conversation like this, which is meant to transform behavior and give us a positive oomph. I think about a colleague who is a, a woman in her early 40s. She's about five feet tall. She's a dinky little person, just full of energy and full of life. She, as a white person from Texas, is out there working for a major corporation, going all over the world, doing diversity classes. And the first thing she recognizes and does when she walks into her classes, she says, you're probably all wondering what a 40-year-old white woman from Texas is only five feet tall can tell you about diversity. And the honesty of that statement up front just puts it there, and you're with her from the moment she says that. That's what Crystal's given you. That's what my friend gives us. And that's what every one of us can do in our pitches. Look for that moment of honesty that connects us into the, what Crystal was talking about, the who, the why, the how, the what. What are the barriers we want to overcome? What are the things we want to inspire? And it's those wonderful little moments, almost of spontaneous honesty, that are the most effective in the pitches. You can write all night long, but you can't develop that unless you're coming from the heart and setting aside your concerns about letting down your barriers and being honest with the audience you want to reach because advocacy is connection. Right. And that kind of takes us into the second part here is about being inclusive, right? So it's, you know, nothing for us without us. So if it's not your story, don't pretend it is your story, right? And really work with the groups that it's impacting. Go to that person or that group, you know, build the relationship, ask, what do you need? What is your story? Can I share your story? Can you share your story, right? And bring them into that ab advocacy work. Um, because that it's not just going to make the pitch more impactful, right? That's an important piece of it. We want it to have impact so that we can make the positive change. Um, but it's going to create the relationships with those stakeholders, because the groups that we're impacting, those are our stakeholders too. Just like you said, students, your student group, um, Shamika is one of your stakeholder groups. Um, and it's also the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do is to bring the people that you are, you know, that are impacted by these services programs into that conversation. Um, just, you know, one example, you might look at your census data and see that you have a large Spanish speaking community in your area and you feel that these services, services focused on this community are needed. So if I were going to do that, I am a non Spanish speaking, you know, middle aged white woman. Uh, and I can think I know what the Spanish speaking community here wants or needs. Um, but really, I don't unless I go out and I build those relationships and ask and bring them into that conversation. Then when I go to the stakeholders that I need to fund these programs, it's not only going to be more impactful, but we're actually gonna get the right, the things that we need because the, the need is coming directly from the group that it's going to impact. Okay. Paul, would you like to take us into what is next? Part three, I have my pitch. What now? The screen needs to wake up. There, there we, we go. go. It woke up. Let's think as we look at this wonderful image 
of our pitches as bright shining stars in a clear evening sky of advocacy. We need to put all those stars together and build the constellations that make our pitches effective. If we keep our sights on the idea that they light up our skies and that they extend beyond anything that we have as we set out to do these things, we set our sights high and we actually reach goals that are far higher than what we set out to get. So as we think about our pitch and we've, we've got it together, Sh Shamika now has the beginnings of a pitch that she can work on and probably apply within the next week or two if she's got the right audience and is ready to go out there. We're hoping that all of you that are watching the archive version of this will have a similar feeling as you come with this. Keep in mind here that getting that pitch out requires a lot of work. We've alluded to it in earlier parts of this conversation. You want to start with your personal contacts. Those are going to be your low hanging fruit. People that are in the office next door to you. People that if you're still working remotely during COVID are with you on your weekly or daily Zoom calls. These are the people you reach out to first. Then you go to the friends of your friend, you ask them to pitch it. Because again, it doesn't matter what you tweet or what you say, it's who repeats that and how that gets to the right audience. You wanna think of the colleagues of those colleagues. You wanna think about the businesses and other organizations in your community who may be able to support you. And finally, you wanna think about the social media outreach and how that can augment what you're already doing. Literally, the thing we wanna do here is fire on all cylinders and create constellations of light that are so inclusive and so well connected that there's no stopping the steamroller effect of a positive pitch made for a positive cause that has a wonderful answer to the question, so what? That's where you wanna be. We have a lot, actually it's a great question right here. Let's stop here. Crystal, you wanna leave this part of it? Sure, so um, what will you do within the next two weeks as a result of your participation in this workshop. Are you watching the archive version? This is your chance to do that? Shamika, you're on the spot. What is one thing <laughs> you'll do as a result of, of your participation in this conversation? Well, this is something I'm gonna bring to the table. I don't think I will, well, I can come up with some ideas on my own, but I think this is something I wanna take to the bigger table because I was just jotting down notes about building relationships, asking, um, about bringing folks into the conversation. And so I think since, you know, I, I'm one of um, five academic librarians here, full-time academic librarians here, um, it will be great to bring it to the table too, not just our, our full-timers, but to also our, our part-timers and our staff and see what they, how they feel about um, the barrier of, of faculty buy-in. And so, um, it would be great to kind of hear what everyone else's thoughts are before I proceed. I, I kind of have some ideas on how I would like to proceed, but I want to make sure that um, all voices are heard in this. That's wonderful. That's For those of you thinking about this, as you watch this asynchronously, realize that there are a lot of different resources here for you. There's the recording itself. There are those of us that have facilitated the session. If you know Shamika or you come across her, you can always check in with her to see how her pitch worked out. And remember, you're part of the larger community that's sponsoring all this. You're part of the California Library Association. You're not alone in writing your pitches. You have a formal committee, the California Library Association Advocacy and Legislation Committee. You can reach out to members there for help. Tell them the issues that are of importance to you so they can advocate at the statewide level for you. They can also help you to better communicate with the people in urban and rural libraries around the state. The mantra here, you are not alone. You have that resource committee. You also have something we've been putting together on the CLA website. If you go to the website, California Library Association, it's CLA, dot, or CLA slash net dot org, you'll find a whole set of legislative and, and advocacy resources. And one of those is a page that we continue to expand that has resource tools. There are stories from advocates. There are videos from advocates. There are toolkits from other organizations, both in California and outside of the state. And we're continuing to add to that. We're in the process of making the video recordings more accessible. Even before we get those up on that page, you can always go to the CLA YouTube channel and look at some of the previous recordings. There's a wonderful one last fall from the Dillons where they're talking about the process of advocating at the legislative level as lobbyists on behalf of libraries all around the state. You wanna know how to advocate at that level? Watch that video. That's the experts telling you how it's done. You can look at some of the earlier videos where we've talked about the basics of advocacy. We'll be repeating some of those episodes at some of those uh, seminars as we go later into this year. If it wasn't clear to you at the beginning of the video, we are going to be doing this every month, second Wednesday of the month. Sessions will either be 90 minutes or two hours, depending on the content we wanna cover, but they'll always start at 10 a.m., second Wednesday of the month, 
registration will continue through the California Library Association. And here's our doing the pitch. Help us help you. Get the word out that these sessions are there. Get the word out that the videos are there. Get the word out that the advocacy resources are there so people don't have to go spending hours and hours themselves searching for the time that uh, the resources that we spent hours locating for you and that we'll continue to add to. If you see a resource that you think is worth sharing, contact me, paul at paulsignorelli.com. And if it's a resource that I think fits into what we're doing there, we'll get that on that page so that you're helping us to build up a better library of resources for advocates for all over the state. We're all in this together and you are not alone. You have people you can come to. So use that community of learning, that community of advocacy, and let's make the positive difference that we want to make in our community. Crystal, anything you want to add at this point? Um, I just wanted to thank Shamika um, for sharing so openly with us. I mean, that really helps the conversation to move forward. And I feel like that's one of the best ways we can learn by just kind of talking through what your scenario is and, and getting that going. So thank you so much. Um, Paul, do we want to go ahead and do a visual summary? Yeah. And again, just to explain what's going on here, we all know that we get overwhelmed with too much text, text on screens. And so a technique that we've been using pretty consistently is instead of bullet points, draw a few of the images from the presentation and hit the main points here as a way of anchoring those into your own memory. So here we started with the idea that our pitches need to be as beautiful and as graceful and eye-catching as anything that we've seen on the murals that Crystal so lovingly put together here. The second thing we looked at was acknowledging that the one important element of creating a successful advocacy pitch is acknowledging and working with the idea that it's a tug of war. You're competing against everybody else in your community for the time of the people you're trying to reach. So it better be compelling, it better be meaningful, and it better be engaging. You pull, you want them to pull back with you rather than against you. And that only comes from the kind of thing that we've talked about for the last 90 minutes in terms of establishing what's out there, what, what the need is, what our role is to help, and to move on from that. Third thing we did, we spent considerable time talking about how to craft our pitches in ways that make them irresistible, focusing on the personal nature of those pitches and how they make a difference in their communities. And finally, as we reach the final moments of our time together, we want to focus on the idea that if we pull it all together, we become the bright shining stars in our community with the other bright shining stars, co-conspirators in a process of making communities better at small, medium, and large scale levels. When we talk about advocacy, it's not clear to you from the beginning here, advocacy is not just going out and talking to your legislators. It's not just running around with banners and annoying people. It's finding an engaging way to identify a common need that we can meet and by working together produce results. If that isn't heartwarming and motivating, I'm not sure what is. Crystal? I just want to remind everyone that um, it's not going to be perfect. And definitely at first, it will not be perfect. And so practice, practice, practice. Even if you want to, I'm going to show you our email. Let's see, we'll just go straight there. If you want to practice your pitch, I know that Paul would be happy to hear it. I would absolutely be happy to hear it. Practice on your colleague. Um, and then as Paul said, you know, the, the folks that are in your orbit might be the first people to start with, and that's going to help you become more comfortable with that pitch before you move on to your other stakeholders. We will soon be getting the word out for our next session, which is going to be a follow up to this one. We'll be talking about uh, actually writing advocacy letters, which builds off of what we talked about today. Again, that'll be the second Wednesday of May. I'm looking at a calendar. If I'm reading correctly, it's May 11th. We'll start at 10, be done by 11.30. Crystal, Deborah Doyle, and I are already signed up for that as the facilitators, and we're looking at one other person I'm hoping to confirm today. So watch for the announcement of that very soon. And in our final moments together, Shamika or Holly, what questions have we not answered that you were hoping to get answered? I think you guys answered everything. I Honestly, I'm like I'm, I'm my my head is full right now. I'm still trying to process, but honestly, I think you you've answered everything. Thank you. Yes. Great. Well, Shamika, I'm invested in your pitch, and I want to know what happens. <laughs> so, Same for me. Let me know. Holly, anything else you want to add about CLA? Anything we've missed? Nope. Uh, you gave the there. website. Everything's great. All right. If we're there. 
then we'll have this recording up as soon as we can get it up. We'll put the PowerPoint decks out there, which will have additional slides we didn't show here. There were some that were the conversation starters. So if you were kind of trying to figure out what was there, those are all there in that deck along with our speaker notes. So you can always go back and use that as a resource. We're glad you were with us. We hope you'll continue to join us. And again, our pitch to you, spread the word. We're here for you and we want to make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you.